Okay, this is the lecture video for Mac 1140 Pre-Calculus. This is section 5.3. And in this section, we're going to be taking a look at different things that you can do with exponential functions. Namely, we are going to be looking to uh, have the ability to evaluate an exponential function. Also, to be able to solve exponential equations. We want to be able to graph the exponential functions and then also have the ability to identify when given a table of values whether that table of values represents a linear function where the graph is a, is a straight line or whether it represents an exponential function which has a completely different graph and we'll take a look at that um, and be able to come up with the function ourselves. Okay, so let's start off by looking at the formulas that we're going to be using throughout this section. We see the uh, actual function notation here. It says the function. You can see that you have an exponential function. It has a coefficient, a base, and an exponent. So this coefficient right here this coefficient which is called C is actually referred to as the initial value. That's the name of that coefficient when you're talking exponential functions. It is the initial value of the function. It is calculated like this. If you take the function and evaluate it at a value, an x value of 0, you will get that C value, which is stated down below anyway. It's right there. And that's equal to the C value. So just plug in 0 into the function and you'll get the C value. That'll be used when we're trying to compose our own exponential functions later in the section. This A value, which plays the role of the base in the exponential expression um, and is referred to in the actual exponential formula as A, and there's a name for that as well. It is called the growth factor. Okay, all of that information is stated below. There are stipulations on the A as well as the C value. The A value cannot be negative. It's got to be greater than 0, but it also can't be 1. The C value, which is that coefficient out there, cannot be equal to 0. So there are some stipulations on those two values. This question in example 1 is just a typical My Math Lab question where they're just making sure, as they do in every section, whether you've read the definitions and the theorems. So you're filling in the word here as a function of this form. Well, you've been, just been introduced to a function of that form, and it is called, I can't fit it in there, so I'll just write it out. This is called an exponential function going to abbreviate there. Uh, and then they give you the stipulations that are mentioned in the definition. The base A has a name, and they're trying to get that name from you. So we just discussed that the A value is called the growth factor. So they'll probably offer you a pull-down menu for questions like this. And then the C value that has a name also, as we just introduced, and it is called the initial value. So just some terminology that you're getting by reading the definitions. Okay, this is uh, information about how to calculate um, various, you know, the values that you're going to need if you're going to create your own exponential functions. This is how you would evaluate A. In case you don't understand this, all this says is that when you do want the A value, there are infinite values, an infinite set of values that you can use. And all it takes is you um, evaluating the function. Just decide what you're going to use up here, something that can be uh, plugged in as about an x value that belongs to the function. Decide what you're going to use up here, and the x value that you use up here should be one bigger than the x value you use down here. Okay, so make that numerator an x value that's one bigger than the x value you're going to plug in down at the uh, denominator level, and that will get you the a value. 
Um, the C value, we already discussed that up above. That C value is achieved by taking the function and plugging in 0 as the X value. Okay, that'll be used later. Select the correct choice that completes the sentence below. We just discussed this. Um, what does this value get you? It gets you the A value. They may ask you for the name of that, which is just the growth factor, as we discussed above. Okay, so let's see. Uh, then we start getting into the problems where all we're doing is evaluating, so just kind of practicing using your calculator. If the exponent has an operation in and of itself that needs to be done, wrap it in parentheses. Like here, this has an operation that needs to be done before you're going to go 8 to whatever that, that uh, power is, and that is division. So put the parentheses around it to tell your calculator to do the division first. But let's just go press these in one at a time. Um, you know, you can do these by hand. You may have them memorized. 5 to the third just means 5 times 5 times 5, but of course you have a power key in your calculator. And it is 125, same thing that you would get if you multiplied this out longhand. And of course, we don't need to do that. Here, you can do it in the calculator just by going 8 raised to a power of 2 divided by 3. You should also know how to do that by hand. So let's review what this means. When you have a, power, a rational exponent, rational means fractional. When you have a fractional exponent like this, um, the 3 that you see in the denominator of that fraction, that is the index on the radical. So it would go right there. This is the exponent that stays attached to the base. In case you are asked to write this out as though you were going to do it without the calculator. So you would go like this. There's a radical involved. Look at the bottom. The index is 3. Then take this base and that exp the top number is the exponent that's going to stay attached to the base. Okay, if you were going to do this by hand, I would say just to keep the numbers as small as possible because if you square this out, it's going to be 64, just making it harder. So if you cover up that 2 just for the time being, just think about what's the cube root of 8. Most students know that at this level, so it won't be too hard for you to think about it. Just 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, so therefore that's the cube root of 8, the number 2. So once you think about... What is the cube root of just that base? Kind of ignoring that for the, for the moment. Think about that. We said it's 2. And then you can reattach this exponent. And we see you get the same answer that our, as our calculator gave us when we just relied on the calculator to do everything. But that's just knowing how to do it by hand. Okay, 2 to the... Second power, if you were going to do this by hand, try to remember that a negative exponent, a fractional exponent means you have a radical. A negative exponent, like what you're seeing right here, means you have a fraction. That this not, It does not mean that this is negative, which students at this level will mistakenly often think that. It means that this is a fraction, and the fraction is like this. It's 1 over, you take this, all of this and bring it down to the bottom. But now, as you drag it from what's considered the top down to the bottom, that exponent goes from being negative to positive. So this is really 1 over 4. And if you put it in your calculator, you will get the same thing. 2 raised up to a power of negative 2. And if you want to see that fraction rather than a decimal, hit math, enter, enter. And there's that same answer, 1 4. Okay, so we have our three answers there, 125, 4, and 1 fourth. So let's go to the next page. And in the next page we have um, properties of exponential, of the exponential function. 
And we already talked about how the A value has to be greater than one. Um, and we're looking at examples of two parent graphs. Parent graphs are, are when you don't have anything added to the function which would lift it up or drag it down depending on whether it's positive or negative. In other words, you don't have any vertical shift. You don't have any multiplier out here which makes it wider or narrower depending on what kind of coefficient it is. So these are what we call parent graphs. You also have nothing being added or subtracted from the x value. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. See, that's what we call, this is what we call parent graph. If we start, um, you know, altering this in order to, su to suggest like a vertical shift on this graph, there would be a number added or subtracted here or a multiplier out here as I just stated. So look at some key features on this problem. I think I just made this too big. Let's bring that down a little bit. Okay, so some of the features on this graph is that, and notice the shape because you want to memorize these shapes so that if you are, when you go to show the work and the table, you can pick some very small, easy values to use to, in order to get your um, graph. And we're going to be doing graphs that have transformations. In other words, they're vertically shifted or horizontally shifted. And we want to be able to think about how to get the values on the parent graph using real easy numbers like 0, 1, and negative 1. And if you know the shape, then you're going to get the entire graph because knowing the shape with just a couple of basic points will get you the entire graph. You don't need to make a full blown out um, table like this. Okay, so notice that it has um, one tail that flutters along the x-axis. There's a name for the x-axis. When we're naming it as an equation, this x-axis is called y is equal to zero. That's because every single point on the x-axis has a y-coordinate of zero. This for this, therefore, this equation names the x-axis. So notice that this exponential graph, f of x, actually has one tail that flutters along above the x-axis coming closer and closer but never actually getting right on top of it never never actually lying on top of it it always hovers slightly above it okay so this whole curve represents the exponential function notice that this graph is what we call an increasing graph. And if you don't remember how to tell whether something's increasing or decreasing, you scan the graph always from left to right. And if the Y values are going up, in other words, the graph is climbing upward and to the right, if those Y values are going up, we call this an increasing graph. And notice that on this particular graph, that if I travel along the curve, look, this y value that I'm at right now, uh, right here is 1 half. Then as I continue, the next y value is 1. Then as I continue, the next y value is 2. Then as I continue, next y value is 4. Notice that those y values are going up, regardless of what y value you start on. They're just going up, and that is always the feature of an increasing graph. Y values are going up as you travel along the curve. Okay. Now this is always going to happen. It's always going to be an increasing graph when the base is greater than one. Okay, so that's a way to tell right away before you even graph it that it is going to be a graph that climbs upward and to the right, as all increasing graphs do. Notice that this next table of values, and then, you know, like some other things that you might want to, before we look at the next graph, notice that um, an exponential graph that hasn't been flipped over or shifted this way or shifted this way or shifted up, in its parent form, it always goes right through 0, 1. Okay, so that happens to be the y-intercept. Now if I start shifting the graph around, if I take the graph and pick it up or pull it down or move it left or move it right, 
then of course that point's not going to be there, but we're talking about basic features of the parent graph. Y-intercept is 0, 1. Okay, then um, if we look at this one right here, notice that the main difference is that it goes completely in the opposite direction. This graph climbed upward and to the right, this one does the opposite. So if we were to describe this particular graph, again, you scan it going left to right. And as you go left to right, you're actually following the curve moving this way. You're not following the curve moving that way because then you're going to think it's, oh, these are going up. You're always to scan it going this way. So because otherwise you get the reverse of the answers. So as you travel along this curve, notice that instead of the y values going down, I mean, as, instead of the y values going up as they were on this increasing graph, they're going down. So see, look, at this y is 4, then it's 2, then it's 1, then it's 1 half. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So notice that this also has a tail that flutters above, right above and stays above the x-axis, which again, that x-axis is called y is equal to zero. You need a way to name the x-axis because they're going to ask you in questions where the function approaches a certain line but never actually breaches that line. That's called an asymptote because at that line, the function would um, be undefined. So this is called um, an asymptote. So whether you have an increasing exponential graph or whether you have what's called a decreasing graph. where instead of the y's going up, they are going down. So regardless of which one you have, the tail in one direction flutters right above the x-axis, which is called y equal to zero, and that is known as the asymptote. So if they say, what is the asymptote? You're going to give it as an equation, and therefore you need to know how to state that x-axis as an equation. So here we go, looking at some features. I want you to notice that the parent graph that caused this particular shape, decreasing y values, and therefore we refer to this as a falling or decreasing graph asymptote at y equal to zero. Notice that the base for this one, unlike the base for this one, is a number between 0 and 1. So in this particular problem, the base was greater than the 1, which produces an increasing exponential graph. And when um, you have this kind of base, okay, the base is 1 half. Notice that that's a number between 0 and 1. That's the type of base And we know that the base is referred to as the A value, so I'm going to refer to it like that. But let me just try to put here that it's between 0 and 1. The base is the A value, and it'll when it's between something between 0 and 1, which just means that the top um, of this fractional base, the top will be less than the bottom if it's a number that's less than 1. Okay, because they could give you a fractional base where the top is bigger than the bottom. And then you're in this case right here. That means that you have, if the top number is bigger than the bottom, you have a base that's greater than one. So it's not that it's a fraction per se, it's what kind of fraction it is. All right, top less than the bottom, you're going to be into a decreasing graph. And we're talking about the base whenever we talk about um, the A value, and that is this right here.
Okay, notice that it also goes through 0, 1, and we already talked about that it has the same asymptote. So we're going to be using um, these parent graphs when we go to do transformations. Transformations is when we start weaving vertical and horizontal shifts and other, kind of trans other types of transformations right into the graph. So these are the basic parent graphs. You may be asked for the domain and the range on a graph. That is a typical question that you should be able to handle when looking at your graph. Remember that if you are asked questions regarding um, the domain, that is a question about, hey, what are the x's on this graph? What kind of x values do you see on this graph? So look at this graph. Notice that it expands indefinitely in the x direction. So this goes out to negative infinity is when you answer domain, you're actually talking about the width. How far left, how far right does it go? This arm right here, this part of the graph right here may be deceiving to you. Maybe you're thinking that it shoots straight up, but it actually expands outward like that. So this expands out. Even though it looks like it's going up, it actually gets wider and wider and wider, and therefore we say it expands to positive infinity. So this graph goes from negative infinity to positive infinity as it gets wider and wider, and therefore this is the domain. That's always going to be the case for all exponential functions, even when they have vertical shifts, horizontal shifts, and other types of transformations. Okay, the range, however, the range, which is all about the y values, that is a discussion of what's going on with the y values. So the asymptote dictates that. If you see that the entire graph is above this level right here called y equal to 0, you have to look at the asymptote hold, that's holding up the graph. Every single y value, and again, when we're talking about range, we're talking about just the y values. Every single y value on this graph is bigger than 0. Look at them. 1 eighth, 1 half, 1, 2, 4. They're all bigger than 0. So... One way to say that, if you're going to speak in interval notation like that, is the y values are anything from 0, or and not including 0, but I mean we start our interval at 0. We say from 0 to infinity, but because we have parentheses around the 0, that means that it doesn't actually lie on 0, otherwise we'd have a bracket there. And then the y values get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, for this particular graph right here, if you want to have a conversation um, about domain, same thing. All of these um, exponential graphs have a domain. This, this goes all the way out to negative infinity. This arm actually gets wider and wider if you were to continue graphing values. So this goes out to negative infinity, and this goes to positive infinity. So once again, the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, even though this one's going in the opposite direction, the range is still every single y value is above the x-axis. In other words, above y is equal to zero. So if this is what it's, if the graph is above y is equal to zero, that means all these values are going to be greater than zero. So look at them, one eighth, one fourth, one half. All of these values are greater than zero. So again, a range from zero to infinity, but not including the endpoint uh, zero. Okay, different things you're going to be asked regarding your graphs. Okay, moving to example four. We say, decide whether the following statement is true or false. These two graphs are identical. Well, from what we just took a look at on the opposite page, notice that when the base is greater than 1, when that base is greater than 1, we refer to the base as the A value, the graph looks like this. It's increasing. So it climbs upward and to the right. Whereas when this base is in between 0 and 1, then we're into a picture that doesn't climb to the right, it climbs left. So this is a 
what we refer to as an increasing graph. The y values would be increasing, getting bigger. And here, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and following that curve left to right, here the y values will be getting less and less and less. So this is an increasing graph, this is a decreasing graph, and so of course they cannot be identical. They're going in opposite directions. So if those are identical, identical, that's false. Example 5, which of the following exponential functions is an increasing function? Remember how I described the increasing function that the base, also known as a, will always be bigger than 1 anytime it's increasing. Okay, so notice that 5 over 4, when the top is bigger than the bottom, that's a number bigger than 1. 5 divided by 4 is 1.25. That is not bigger than 1. This is not bigger than 1. Without you turning it into a decimal, when the top is smaller than the bottom, that's a number between 0 and 1. Okay, and then same thing here. Okay, so this is the only one that has a base greater than 1. This base right here, this is the base. That's the base, that's the base, that's the base. So this base was between 0 and 1. It has to be this condition to be increasing. This base was between 0 and 1, that 4 ninths. And of course that last base, 0 0.9, is between 0 and 1. So, nope, nope, nope. All right, example 6. Which of the following is the range, the y values, of an exponential function? And we just talked about that for both the increasing and the decreasing graph on the previous page. And this was the range for both of them. Okay, approximating. Approximating it is, means it's okay to give a decimal rather than giving it any kind of an exact value. They're even telling you to round to three decimal places. So very easy. Get in your calculator and let your calculator do all the work. 14 raised to 3.1415, 3986.220. That 19 right there, you're trying to decide what should I do with the 9. You have to round it up, which would make it a 10, spilling the 1 into this place of 0.220. 3.9 0.220 okay then 12 raised to a power of pi 2456 and then 676 okay then Let's see, this one is 123 times e raised to a power of 0.035 times 9. 123 times e. e is a function right in the first column, about three keys up from the bottom. Okay, so e was being raised to a power of 0.035 times 9. So close that up. Therefore, your calculator will do that first, then it'll take e and raise it to that power, and then it, the last thing it does is multiply by the 123. So it already has order of operations built in, and you're letting your calculator do all of that. We come up with 168, rounding to three decimal places, 0.542. Okay, let's look at some of the tables below. And in these tables, um, we're trying to decide, uh, determine whether or not these table of values, in each case, represent a linear function, do they represent an exponential function, or do they represent neither? Okay, for the linear functions, when there is a linear function, you should expect a consistent difference all the way down the y values and all the way down the x values. Okay, so you're looking for a consistent difference coming down this side as well as this side. 
Okay, so notice that if you go um, in this particular case, we always go from the smaller value to the bigger value. So you can go either way just to determine whether it's a linear. So um, it is 2 take away 5. Okay, the difference between those two, negative 3. Negative 1 minus 2, negative 3. Negative 4 minus 1. And, you know, um, when you're doing this, you can just put it in your calculator. Go 2 minus 5. Then go negative 1 minus 2. You'll get negative 3. Then go negative 4 minus negative 1. You'll get negative 3. Anyway, do you see that the same, same thing here? Negative 7 minus negative 4. You'll get negative 3. You can press those into your calculator. Notice that we had a consistent difference all the way down the Y column. Now you're looking to make sure that there's a consistent difference all the way down the X column. It doesn't have to be a negative 3, but whatever that first difference is, it better come out the same each time. And it wouldn't, you know, once you check it a, a few times, you know that there's consistency there. So 0 take away 1, that's a difference of positive 1. 1 take away 0, that's a difference of positive 1. 2 take away 1, okay, you have consistency there as well. So when you see that this is the case, that this means that this is a linear function. And if it's a linear function, they're going to want you to find um, the rule that represents that linear function. So anytime we're dealing with any kind of linear function, we need a slope and a y-intercept. In fact, remember that this is the, uh, the formula for a linear equation when you know the y-intercept. It's slope times x plus b, where y would be the f of x portion. Okay, so you want the linear function. I need this, need that slope, and I need the y-intercept. y-intercept is always this the function evaluated at zero. The function where an x value of zero has been entered. That's on the table right here. Look, here is the x value of zero. The function evaluated at this x value turns out to be two. So in this case, this is equal to two. I already know what the y-intercept is. It is always the value you get when you take the function value and evaluate it at an x value of 0. And that y partner is that actual y-intercept. The slope, there's a formula for. So you can go slope is equal to uh, two y values subtracted from each other, if you have forgotten that. I'll write it right here. Over their corresponding x partners. So we can also calculate that for ourselves. Okay, just take, you know, you might want to work with, um, try to work with two positives just to make it easier. But if you went this number minus this number, subtracting as you go up, two take away five, you get negative three. So you have the numbers already. That's what these numbers were coming down the side. And when you go zero, take away negative one, you get positive one. Therefore, that is your slope. Knowing now that I know the slope as well as the y-intercept, this is my y-intercept, this is my slope. So now let's write the function that represents this table of values. The function, in other words, y, I'm still really using this equation right here, is slope times x plus y-intercept. My slope is negative 3 times x plus my y-intercept, and my y-intercept is 2. Okay, and that's the equation. I did the slope. I did the y-intercept, which is just a function evaluated at 0, and then finally dumped it into function format. This is slope times x plus y-intercept, which is really just that equation there, with the f of x written in place of the y. Okay, moving on to the second table. The second table, um, I'm looking at these y values, and I'm noticing that these are all such, um, are all uh, base 2 raised to a particular exponent. Like, look at this value down here, the smallest one. That would be 2 raised to a power of 1. So, like, if, if you were going to write this as um, 
an exponential function, yes, we are going to figure out the C and the A value. Because remember, when you're writing um, an exponential function, it's like this. Comes in this form. F of X is equal to the C value times the base raised to the power of X. That's what you'd be plugging into. Just like you have a formula here for a linear function, this is the formula for an exponential function. So we'd have to have that figure out that C and the A value. But just to get a general sense that it's an exponential function, look at these numbers. This is uh, 2 to a power, an exponent of 1. This is 2 to an exponent of 2. This is 2 to an exponent of 3. Notice that you can use the same base, but just keep changing the x value to get a bigger and bigger number. So this is an exponential function, but we need to know that c and that a value. So first of all, let's do the c value. I had mentioned a couple of times on previous pages that the c value is nothing more than the function evaluated at zero. It is the y-intercept, actually. So come up here and look for an x value of zero. There it is right there, and go grab its y partner and that is your c value. So when the function is evaluated at zero, we get a y partner of 16. Next thing we need is, so we have the c value, we need this a value. Now I'm gonna move over here and do this. Well, maybe I'll try to do it here. All right, so let's do the a value. There's a formula for that also. It is f of x plus one, over f of x. And as I tried to explain what that really means is just use a bigger x value here, uh, x, uh, x value that's one bigger than the one down here. So that could be just about anything from this table. You could use two at the top and one at the bottom as your x values. You could use one and zero, whatever you want. I'm going to use um, one at the top, so I'm going to be evaluating at the x value of one and then I'm going to use f of 0 on the bottom. Okay, so this value is 1 bigger than this one. Okay, go get those values from the table. Okay, the function evaluated at 1 is equal to 8. The function evaluated at 0, we already talked about that, is equal to 16. So this turns out to be 1 half. So you have your A value and you also have your C value. So when you go to write this function, it is the C value. Now write the base, and it's a fraction, so let's keep it in parentheses, raised up to a power, the base is always raised up to a power of X. Okay, and that's your answer there. F of X is equal to 16 times, and don't multiply these together and get 8. This is a base in and of itself. This is just the coefficient out in front of that base. The base never changes. And you just give it like that. Okay, looking at this next table, um, I, I always check linear first, so let me see if there's a common difference coming down the side. So 4 take away 2, difference of 2. 7 take away with uh, four, that killed it right there. You already have ruined the consistency just in checking the Y column, so it's not linear. Okay, now let's check for exponential. Is there some base that we could just raise to successively higher exponents in order to get these string of Y values? Well, I don't know. This would be 2 to the 1. This would be two squared, but then by the time you get here, it ruins it because there is, you cannot take two raised to any number and get a seven. It's just it's impossible. So there's no way for that to continue on the exponential path. So it's not exponential. Oops, I missed a letter here. spell better. Okay, so this is not linear, and I don't really have enough room to write that out. It's not exponential. So then we say this one is neither, and therefore we cannot get the function for it.
All right, so here we came up with a linear function. Here we came up with an exponential function, identifying the C value, the initial value, and also the base called the growth factor. Start them off with f of x. Moving to the next page. Let's see. Get these pages. All right. So here is where you have to understand how to get points and know what the shapes are for these particular problems. Um, also, you have to, you know, recall what you learned about vertical shifting and horizontal shifting from previous classes, and I'm going to review that right now. Okay, first of all, I think I'm going to write the expression that actually gives us the shape, this exponential function. I'm going to write that first, and then I like to write my vertical shift as the last thing. So that four, that's your vertical shifter. So let's review what these things are. When there is a number combined um, with the x, that is what we call a horizontal shift. Anything that is being done to your x variable, you are going to respond to that shift in the graph or that transformation on x, because these are all transformations on either the x values or the y values, which change the shape um, of the graph. It does different things to move the graph around. So when there's any kind of a horizontal transformation, you are going to switch the operation only for the x's. Only horizontal transformations are you going to switch the operation. So if you see that this says take 2 away from the x's, you are going to add 2 to the x's. And I'll tell you where we're going to get those basic x's to begin with. Okay, so that's one thing you have to remember from previous courses. All horizontal transformations, you are going to switch the operator. If this was to show positive 2, then you would subtract 2. If you, this was to show a 5 times x, indicating multiplication, you would switch that operation and do division by 5. Anything done on the x. However, any other numbers that are not bound or attached to the x, those are things that uh, transform the y's. It's a transformation or you know, on your y values. So this, you see that this is just a free loose number. It is not up there attached to this x expression. So this is what we call a vertical shifter. You do not switch the operation for, um, for transformations of this nature. Do not switch the operation. Only when it's on the x's, anything horizontal. Okay, so this is how we're going to do this. We are looking to graph this, but we want to do it through transformations, just as the um, directions tell you to do. Use transformations to graph the function. When you finally get done, state the domain, the range, the horizontal asymptote, and the y-intercept. So we're going to do all of that. You're doing it by hand. So the first thing you want to do is ask yourself, what would the parent graph look like? Well, the parent graph is stripped of any kind of transformation. So it would not have this negative 2, just a base to an exponent. And it would not have this extra number vertically shifting it up because a positive 4 takes the whole graph and picks it up 4 units. So that wouldn't be there either. This is what we call the parent graph, free of any transformations. And we're going to start this problem by getting a few basic values for the parent function. Okay, use really simple numbers like zero, maybe a negative number, and maybe its positive counterpart. Okay, when you're going to go get the y partner, that just means you're plugging this x value right in here. You can put that in your calculator if you want. 3 raised to a power of 0 is 1. If you put a negative 1 in there, let's do the easy one first. Let's do 1. If you put a 1 in there, 3 to the 1 would just be 3. 
whoops, put it in the wrong spot. And then if you were using negative one, then you have to remember stuff like, well, anything that has a negative power is really a fraction. And this is how you write the fraction, one over the base to this power, only now the power becomes positive. And that's the same thing as one third. Okay, so if you want to use transformations and actually graph the function that we've been given that's been transformed horizontally as well as vertically, so now we're trying to graph this. But instead of taking our x values and plugging it into something that is, all, is now much more complicated because they've done things to the power and they've done things to the, um, you know, to the constant out here. So uh, the easiest way to get this is to understand what's being done to the x's, what's being done to the y's. So I already had explained to you up above that a negative 2 really means that you're going to act on the x's by adding 2. So that's exactly what we're going to do to the points that we have gotten on the parent graph. We're going to alter the points from the parent graph. That's how you do a transformation. Okay, so if we're going to add 2 to all the x's, that means, um, let's see, we had a 0, add 2 to that, now it's a 2. We had a negative 1, add 2, now it's a 1. So it would be for our next point. For our third point, we had a 1, add 2, now it's a 3. Okay, so we've already acted out what we need to do to the x's. That positive 4, as I explained earlier, it is not wrapped up with this x expression. That means it is acting on the y. We do not switch the operation. So if it says plus 4, you are going to do plus 4 on your y's. Okay, so let's put that here. On the y's, we're going to add 4. What are we adding 4 to? We're adding 4 to the points on the parent graph. Okay, here are the points on the paragraph. We already acted on the x's by adding 2 to each one. We added 2 to that, got 2. Added 2 to negative 1, got a 1. Added 2 to the 1, got a 3. So now we're going to do what we need to do to the y values. Okay, and the y values were, let's see, 1, and I'm going to add 4. That's going to be 5. Um, we had a y value of 1 third. And I'm adding 4, so that's going to be 4 and 1 third. Okay, and then for this third point, um, I am adding 4 to this y value, and that's going to be 3, 7. Okay, so just do them in order. Concentrate while you're doing it. List three points, do them in order. I've acted on all the x's first and this is what I did. Then I acted on all the y values, adding 4, just as this function tells me to do. So you have to be able to read the commands that are being suggested up here in the function. Something with x, you're doing it to x. Anything that is not with x, you're doing it to y. There could be numbers out here, there could be numbers in front. Those would all be operations or transformations on the y values. Okay, let's go ahead and graph these new points. Keep in mind what kind of graph, the shape that the graph has. It'll have the same shape as the parent graph. It's just moved around. Okay, so now we're going to do um, go to 2 and go up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Plot that point. Okay, that's the 2, 5. We're plotting the new graph. Uh, 1, 4, and 1 third. So go to 1. We're going to go up to 4, slightly above the 4 mark. Try and make that a little bit clearer. So 4 and 1 third. And then we're also graphing 3, 7. So 
So we go to three and then up to seven. That's six, this is seven. Okay, and give it that exponential shape. Here it is climbing upward. And this is where the tail flattens out and hovers right above the asymptote. So if you don't get which one, what the asymptote is, let me explain this best I can. Okay, typically the asymptote is right here at the x-axis. However, this is a graph that shifted four units up. That's why it's so high in the air. So if the asymptote used to be, the asymptote that the tail fluttered on used to be the x-axis, even the asymptote moves four units up. The graph as well as the asymptote will be affected by this vertical shift. So now your asymptote is right here. Not at y equal to zero, but now you're at a horizontal line called y equal to four. The four signifying how high this is up in the air. Another way I could say that is every point on this line, dotted line that I just, um, dashed line that I just drew, they all have y coordinates of four. So this whole line, horizontal line, is called y is equal to four. All horizontal lines are called y is equal to the number that they go through on the y axis. Okay, so this serves as the asymptote when they ask us that. Doesn't break through there. Um, you can answer any of these other questions by looking at the graph. So let's answer all of them. Domain. The domain for all these exponential graphs is negative infinity to positive infinity. We went through an explanation of that when we first looked at them. The range has to do with the asymptote. Okay, if the asymptote is at y equal to 4 and the entire graph is above that y equal to 4, that means all the y values on the graph are greater than 4. So 4 to infinity, that means the same thing as greater than 4, not including the 4, because the tail never actually touches the asymptote. It just looks like it blends in with it, but it's hovering slightly above, so close that you can barely see it. Okay, so we answered domain, range, horizontal, asymptote. We already talked about that. And that is y equal to 4, that horizontal line that supports the asymptote, that holds it up. Next thing is the y-intercept. y-intercept can always be calculated for every function by taking the function and evaluating it at 0. In fact, that's the definition of a y-intercept. It is the y partner that belongs to an x value of 0. So just go take the function and plug in 0. So this would be 4, or you can write it the way I wrote it either way. Uh, 4 plus 3, we're plugging in 0 for x minus 2. So this would be 4 plus 3 to the negative 2. You can put that in your calculator if you'd like, that part right there. But it is 1 ninth. So this is equal to 4 and 1 ninth. That's your y-intercept. So in other words, this graph hits the y-axis at 0, 4, and 1 ninth. Just a tiny bit above 4. Again, so close to that line that it looks like it's uh, actually right on the line, but it's not. So we named the y-intercept as well. Okay, moving to example 10. So a lot for you to remember from the previous class, and we'll just keep reinforcing it. Okay, begin with the graph y is equal to e of x. When they tell you what to begin with, that just means that they are so nicely telling you what the parent graph is that's going to build your new function, which is down here. Okay, so we're going to start with f of x is equal to, that's the y that you see right here, e to the x. Okay, notice that there is nothing being done to the x, no numbers out here, no vertical shifters. So this is what we call the parent graph. If you're unfamiliar with e, that's a 
approximately 2.714. We'll just like think of it as 2.7 just to keep it in our mind about what type of number it is. It is a run on decimal just like pi. Irrational, we call them. Okay, so let's do a little table for the parent graph. I said keep it simple. Use values like 0, 1, negative 1, things that are easy to use. You may need to help with your calculator when you go to do the negative 1, but these two should be easy. Uh, here you would be putting a 0 in for x, so it would be e to the 0, but anything to the 0 power is 1. Then here you'd be plugging in a 1 for x, e to the 1, well, being that e is 2.7, but you can put in your calculator if you want, it's approximately 2.7. And e to the negative 1, that you're going to put in your calculator so it can deal with that crazy decimal. So it would just be call up the e function, which is just in the first column, about three keys up from the bottom, dump in a negative 1 as the exponent, press enter. So approximately 0.4. You know, because you have to have a decent way to approximate to approximate as you, if you're going to graph with a decimal. So I'll write what it was. 0.368, but you know, we'll just think of it as 0.4 when we go to graph it. Okay, so um, even though really what we're going to be graphing is the transformed one, so we're never going to get these on the graph. We're just going to put one graph. So here, uh, now we're going to deal with f of x. And there's two things that are being done to alter this graph. The x is being multiplied by negative 1, and then out here you have, to have, then you have a 2. So again, you need to be able to read these commands. Now I went into a big thing on this last problem telling you that any time you have a horizontal transformation, you're going to switch the operation, which wouldn't be a game changer in this problem, but why memorize it one way for one problem when you can memorize it the same way for all problems? Anything done to the x, switch the operation. Let's just train ourselves to be doing that. So if this says multiply by negative 1, then we're going to divide by negative 1 on our x's. Now the reason I said that wouldn't be a game changer is because I think we both know that when you multiply by negative 1 and when you divide by negative 1 you get the same answer, but that's only true for, for 1. We need something that's universal. If it was saying multiply by negative 2, that would not be the same as dividing by negative 2. So let's just memorize one rule. Whatever is being done for the x's, switch that operation. This said to multiply, that's why we are dividing, using the opposite operation that this suggests, uh, but using the same number. And we're doing it on the x's. This concerns the x's. However, this 2 that you see right here, the 2, um, that is not with this x expression. Anything that's not bound or attached to the x's, is an operation on y. So you're using this to act on the x's, you're using this to act on the y's. Anytime you're doing anything to the y values, so this is going to impact the y's, this is going to impact the x's. Anytime you're doing anything to the y values, um, you don't switch the sign. You do exactly what this is implying. This is saying multiply by 2, you're going to keep that operation as is. Multiply by 2 on your y's. Okay, let's go ahead and do those things to the parent points that we have already established. Okay, let's write our three points because we developed three points here. And let's do one thing at a time. First, let's do what we're going to do to the x's, which is to divide each of the x's by negative 1. So 0 divided by negative 1, 0. 1 divided by negative 1, negative 1. Negative 1 divided by negative 1, positive 1. Now let's carry out our plan for the y values. We're transforming those y values. So look at the y values here. Go in the same order as when you did the x's, straight down the table. And I want you to multiply each of those y values by 2. So 1 times 2, 2. 2.7 times 2, 
approximately 5.4. Um, this times 2, put it in the calculator, uh, about 736. Okay, so now let's go and graph this. Okay, when graphing this, let's see, um, we're going to do 0, 2, that's right there, it's our y-intercept, negative 1 and 5.4, so let's see, we're going to go to negative 1, but we're going to go to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, about 5.4 would be about right there, and then we're going to go... Um, see two one and point seven three six okay so one and point seven three six well this would be point five point six point seven okay so one and point seven three six is going to be about right there okay so now what's happening is this is climbing upward this way and then the tail. Now notice that this problem has no vertical shift. And if it has no vertical shift, then the graph has not been lifted from its usual position where the tail flutters right along the, its asymptote, which is the x-axis. If it would have vertically shifted, then not only the curve would be picked up, but also the asymptote would be picked up based on whatever the vertical shift is, which would be here if there was one. But this doesn't have a vertical shift. Now, I know some of you that are, you know, real sharp and thinking about things like, oh, this base was bigger than one. How come it didn't go that way? So if you do have any thoughts of that nature, this is what happens. Yes. Typically, when the base is bigger than 1, it goes like this. But the effect of your x being multiplied by negative 1 is that graph that would have went like this. It flips over the y-axis and causes it to go in the reverse direction. That is the impact of that negative. So that's why you're not seeing it do what you might have been expecting if you were kind of analyzing that. Okay, answering the questions that we have now from our new transformed graph. Um, and in this graph, we have an asymptote right at the x-axis, which is called y equal to 0. So know that that is how you name your x-axis as an equation. We can answer these questions. Let's see what we ask. So we've asked us domain. Okay, this uh, expands indefinitely to the left, this uh, tail right here. It's just that not much of the graph is shown, and this expands indefinitely to positive infinity. So this is your domain, as they are for all exponential functions. The range is controlled by the asymptote. Everything on this curve is above the line y equal to 0. So all y values are greater than 0, and this is a way of saying that. Okay, other question that was asked is, what is the horizontal asymptote for this problem? And that is y equal to zero. You name it like an equation. You name it as an equation. Okay, moving to number eleven. Now we get into problems where we are looking uh, for the solution of an equation that has exponential expressions in it. So the rule for solving an exponential equation is this. If you have an exponential expression on one side and an exponential expression on the other side, as long as the bases are the same, and this is only it would only work if the if you can get the bases rewritten so that they are the same. So for two exponential expressions to be completely equal, if they're the bases are the same, then their exponents also have to be the same. So once you get the bases to be the same, you can work just with the exponents. So you can 
disregard the, the like bases at that point and just set the exponents equal and continue with your work of solving the equation. So we're going to take that, um, you know, that tip right there and try to do this problem. We want to try and get it so the bases are the same. So what you want to see is... Excuse the barking. So what you want to see is if you can write 256 as a base of 4. Okay, so 4 raised to a power of 4, that's 256. So this is the same thing as 4 to the negative x is equal to 4 to the 4th. And then once you get these bases the same, you can just take them out of the mix and work just with the exponent. So negative x is equal to 4. Okay, then you're going to divide by negative 1, divide by negative 1, and you end up with the solution x is equal to negative 4. Or wait, let's see, what did I have here? Okay, so 4 to the negative x, this was 4 to the 4th, so we looked at, yeah, that's right, x to the negative 4th, just wanted to check that out. That's your solution, and you can plug them back in always to check your answer. If you were to check this out, you'd be plugging, you're claiming that that solution can be put right in here and that you would get 256, and of course you can. If you went 4 to a negative power, and you went and put in the solution that you got, you would then have 4 to the positive 4th, which we already showed ourselves in the calculator, is 256. Okay, moving to the next problem. Again, looking to try and get those bases to be the same. We can make a 49 out of a base 7. So we're going to rewrite this. This will be 7 squared for the 49, but this 49 was already being raised to a power of 5x. This we're going to leave it as is. The power is x squared minus 24. We're going to merge these two powers. If you recall, when you are working with exponents, if you're going to use the power raised to a power rule, the rule is when carrying out power to a power, you multiply the powers. So this equation becomes 7 to the x squared minus 24 is equal to 7 to, multiplying these two, 10x. Once the bases are the same, you can disregard the bases and work just with the exponents. So x squared minus 24 is equal to 10x. This produces a quadratic equation and in that case all terms must be on the same side so you'd have x squared minus 10x minus 24 is equal to 0. Okay, You'd have to break this up so x squared then think of two numbers that multiply to give you this constant negative 24 but the, same, the numbers that you come up with here, and there's several pairs, that's why you always want to satisfy this second step at well, um, as well. As, let's face it, you could go 2 times 12, 1 times 24, 6 times 4. You, you need to find the pair that also adds up to negative 10. And if you're going to satisfy both of these simultaneously, that can only be one pair of numbers. And that would be, let's see, how can we do this? We could go... 12 and 2. We can use 12 and 2 to try and get that. If we're trying to get, um, let's see, when I move that over, that was a negative 10x and a negative 24 is what I had. So if I'm looking for two numbers that satisfy that, um, I can use 12 and 2. Let's see. If I put a 12 here and a 2 here and here as well, and really, this second thing is what allows you to figure out whether or not um, you're using the right signs. If I put the negative here, well, that times that would give me a negative 24. And when I add these, I get a negative 10. So the numbers are negative 12 
and positive 2. Okay, that times that is negative 24, whereas that plus that is negative 10. Okay, so now let's get the values for x. Okay, what would make this 0? x equal to positive 12. I mean, the solutions for these are what makes the uh, factor 0. And what would make this 0 would be x equal to negative 2. Okay, so the two answers for that are those right there. Let me place them up here. The answers are negative 2 and 12. And you can, again, you can check them if you want. If you were to put, you know, I'll check out this one. If I put negative 2 right here, that would be 4 um, take away 24. That would be 7 to a power of negative 20. Are you getting the same thing on the other side? Well, if I put the negative 2 in here again, am I getting 7 to the negative 20? Don't forget we said that seven square, uh, seven, 49 is 7 squared. And then plugging in the negative 2 right there, 5 times negative 2 would be negative 10. 2 times negative 10 is 7 to the negative 20. So that works, and if you were to check this answer, that would also work. Okay, moving on to example 13. Solve the equation. So this was negative 4, this one had two answers, and then for 13, solve the equation. Um, we want to kind of clean this up right here. So this is going to be e to the 8x. And when the exponent is down in the denominator like that, that just means it can be written like this, as a negative exponent. So then there's a rule. when multiplying like bases, you add these powers. So this is the same thing as e to the 8x plus negative 12, which is the same thing as 8x minus 12. A plus combined with a minus is a minus. And then over here we have e to the x squared. Okay, so we're at the point where the bases are the same. We have a base of e here, but the power is x squared. We have a base of e here, but the power is 8x minus 12. So when you're at the point, which is, you know, the whole point behind numbers 11, 12, and 13, when you get to the stage where the bases match, you can disregard the bases and work just with the exponents. So this is x squared is equal to 8x minus 12. Okay, again, you have a second degree equation. You're going to need to bring everything to one side and find the solutions. Okay, that's just like what I did in this previous problem. Okay, I got those bases that were 7, and I set this equal to um, 10x. And then by the time I brought the 10x over there, it was a negative 10x, and we went on to factor it. So we're doing the same thing here. We took this power, set it equal to 8x minus 12. We're bringing over the 8x, at which point it becomes negative 8x. We're bringing the negative 12 over. That becomes positive 12, and then we're going to factor this quadratic equation. So factoring that, that would be break up the x squared, and you get x times x is x squared. Then we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give us 12, but that add up to give us negative 8, and that would be 6 and 2. Okay, now we need them to both be negative, negative 6 and negative 2. When you multiply those numbers, you get 12, but when you add them, you get negative 8, so those are perfect. Solutions would be x is equal to 6 and x equal to 2. Okay, so final solutions for... Uh, this problem would be, I'm going to have a ring here, 6 and 2.
Okay, moving to the last problem. In the last problem, um, we're going to be doing uh, looking for a function uh, for this graph that you're looking at. So it says determine the exponential function whose graph is given. The form of the function is f of x with a multiplier out front. They have been calling that the c value. It's just the coefficient. They just happen to call it k here with a base raised up to a power of x. And they tell you that k is the initial point, And that's what they called c throughout this section, indicated by the point um, 0, k. So basically, we just need to find this. OK, we're finding the c value. We're finding the a value, raising it up to a power of x. So I introduced the fact of how you get the c value and how you get the a value, okay, even though they called this k just in this problem. Okay, so when you're doing the c value is just the function evaluated at zero, which you can get right off the graph. Just go look for the point, the y partner that goes with this x value. It's the same thing as plugging it in yourself. So here's the x value of zero. Look at the y partner that comes with it because that y partner is the function evaluated at zero. That's what this means. Go look at the x value and either calculate the y partner yourself or just observe it on the graph. It's negative one. So we have our c value. Now we're going to multiply this by base and put an exponent of x. We need the a value now. Well, there's a formula for that. You want to evaluate at one at an x value that is one bigger in the numerator than the x value you use in the denominator. Again, you could get that off the graph. You can use any two values for x as long as it's uh, one bigger in the numerator than it is in the denominator. So how about this one? This x value is one bigger than this one. So I'm going to evaluate at two in the numerator and one in the denominator. And I can get those values right off the graph. They are just the y partners that go with these x values. So at 2, the y partner is negative 81. And at 1, the y partner is negative 9. Okay, so a is going to be equal to negative 81 divided by negative 9, which is 9. So we now have our c value. We have our a value, we come back over here and finish the function. So the function is the c value, which was negative, oops, I already started to write it. Let me just go with that. No need to write it again. Okay, so that was the c value, which is out front, and then that a value that I just found goes right in there, and that's the function. Okay, that completes section 5.3.